if you were to look at even in the New Testament, the Father is credited as being our Savior, probably just as much as the Son is. And beyond that, we want to look at God's fatherhood, because to Jesus, it is vitally important to understand the privilege that we have as Christians to call on God as our Father. And I don't know if you're like me, but familiarity can breed sort of a contempt, and you can become normalized with things. But you have to, if you just like take a step back and think of the unspeakable wonder that it is to be able to address God, the God of the universe who judges and sees all things and will judge the living and the dead, who knows the hairs on your head, who knows even the various sins that you commit, thought and deed, and to call on him as Father. And so, a better understanding of what we are as beloved children, which it says here in 5 verse 1, we're to imitate God in this way as beloved children, as God being our Father. The more we can understand this, uh, the better we can obey this command to walk in love as, uh, as Christ did. And so, I want to go to the book of Genesis to the beginning. Again, if you're able to follow, great. If not, I'll move pretty quick after that. But I'm going to read a rather large chunk of Genesis 4 and follow it to set up where we have the first sort of concept as it relates to God as a father. You have to read it between the lines a little bit, but if you can follow with me, we'll begin in Genesis 4, verse 14. And yes, this is the story of Cain. So follow with me. I'll go into chapter 5. Behold, this is Cain talking. You have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face, that is God's, I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant, a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So Cain has just killed his brother. He's afraid that people are going to kill him, and God has banished him to be a wanderer. So the Lord said to him, verse 15, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. Now, we don't know what mark this is, what kind of sign it is, whether it's on his body or something, but nevertheless, Cain is given a sign so that nobody will touch him, because if they kill him, vengeance, sevenfold. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, which means wanderer, because that's where he is, east of Eden. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city, and called the name of that city Enoch after the name of his son. So Cain, if we read between the lines, is not content with God giving him just a mark that I'll look out for you. Vengeance will not be, vengeance is mine if anyone kills you. Cain says, I think I'm still going to build myself a city to uh, cover my bases and with a city wall so that people can't come attack me. He keeps going, he has Enoch. Now, he, to Enoch, verse 18, was born Irad, and Irad, Mehuyael, Mehuyael, the father of Meshuel, or Methushel, and Methushel became the father of Lamech. Now we're gonna slow down. Lamech took to himself, not one, but two wives. Uh-oh. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Tzilla. Ada gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So we have the first farmer in the Bible. His brother's name was Jabal, and he was the father of those who played the lyre and the pipes. And now we have musicians show up in the Bible for the first time. As for Tzilla, she gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. And so we have metallurgy. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Namak. <coughs> Lamech said to his two wives, Ada and Zilla, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seven be sevenfold. Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in the place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also was born, and he named his, or sorry, and he called his name Enosh, which means weakness. Then man began to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay. 
New section starting right here in 5 verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Now, key in on that phrase, the likeness. He created them, male and female, and he blessed them and named them man or Adam in the day when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and he named him Seth. We're going to stop there. And so what we see here is we actually have two lines that are beginning. And uh, the one that God wants to highlight now, chapter 5 going forward, and uh, I think it's 10 generations if I'm not mistaken, is the line of Seth. And the line of Seth is contrasted with the line of Cain. And what we saw is God made humanity in his image right in the beginning. Male and female, he created them. He gave them the dominion mandate, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth, rule it. And God's image is very, very tied to rule and family and kinship. Now, if you trace the two lines, however, we do see that man in his rule is becoming more and more creative, which is how God made him. But we also notice at the same time, especially in Cain's line, that yes, now there's musicians, there's engineers, there's farmers, and all sorts of um, innovation in the world as God's image bearers. But at the same time, we have a person who strikes down his brother called Fracticide. He murders him, and he's scared, and he hides. But then his generations keep going, and his great 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 grandson Lamech, he's not even he's not even scared and hide that he's a murderer. He actually threatens his wives, and he says, "Make sure that you listen to me because I've killed people, domestic violence." He's threatening them, and so Cain's line becomes linked in the Bible what we call the seed of the serpent. And in fact, what we come to understand is that every single one of us is born in this line. So it's not just a physical uh, lineage that we're talking about here. We're talking about a spiritual one because Cain falls to sin after God has warned him that it's crouching at the door like a beast, like a serpent. It's ready to attack him and he yields to it. And all of us are now born this way and bent this way. But the other line is that of Seth and Seth's line is, it is, is linked to calling upon the name of the Lord, which is how chapter 4 ends. And beyond this, God makes a very direct link between Adam's, Adam and his son Seth, who's made in his likeness, and Adam, who's made in the likeness of God. And so if we read between the lines, Adam has a son in his likeness, and Adam is called in the likeness of God, making him God's... Son. And if you think that I'm reading to it, that's actually what the Gospel of Luke says at the end of chapter 3. It says, Adam, it says, Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And God wants his image to be remarked upon by those who call upon his name. And so we have a godly line and we have an ungodly line. We have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. That's a huge theme in the Bible. And we have to set this up where God is attaching his name. It's a little bit read between the lines here. What we want to keep going is, is how does God attach his fatherhood to individuals or people as the story goes along? So sonship is tied to creation and rule from the beginning and calling upon the name of the Lord, which implies faith. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip over some more. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 4. This is the next time in a very overt way where God speaks about someone as his son. Exodus chapter 4, verse 23. God is telling Moses what to tell the Pharaoh, which is the king of Egypt. And he says this, So I said to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But you refuse to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son your first born. And so what we see here is Israel, the nation, in bondage in Egypt, God says, I've adopted Israel. They are my child, and I'm adopting them for the purpose that they serve me. 
and I'm going to redeem them. If you know the story, this great exodus, what does God do? I'm sure every kid in this room knows the story. God parts the sea through Moses' staff and his mighty right hand. The water with walls on both sides. It's an amazing redemption. 600,000 people go through the waters on dry land. And what does God do to their enemies? But wash them and drown them and cover them. And he does exactly what he says to Pharaoh here. But what I want us to key in on is that Israel is called God's son for the purpose that they would serve him. Um, if you think that I'm reading into this, that Israel is adopted just because they're called the son here, again, Romans uh, makes this statement. To, to Israel belong the adoption of sons. If you read this in Romans 9. But beyond that, there's a very telling story where God sort of gives more detail to this in the book of Ezekiel. And that's where I'm going to go next, Ezekiel chapter 16. chapter 16, uh, growing up, maybe I'm a little out of date here, but our friends used to say, your mama jokes, if you don't, if you don't know what that is, that's probably a good thing, uh, but it's an insult, you know, it would be a pejorative statement about your mother. Now listen to God and the way he refers to Israel, and listen to the adoption concept show up here. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. Say, thus says the Lord God of Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are from the land of Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. As for your birth, on the day that you were born, he's talking about Israel, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloths. You can just imagine this baby just thrown onto the streets, helpless there. Parents don't give a rip about it. That's Israel. And they are the product of these evil nations, these Gentile, Canaanite, and Amorite. That's what they were. And God is saying by this, Israel was no better than any other nation. They were more righteous. They were the product of all the Canaanite abominations. And that's where he found her. No eye looked with pity on you, verse 5, to do any of the things for you, to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. Now check this, Israel's already born, but when I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you, while you were in your blood, live! Yes, I said to you, while you were in your blood, live! I made you numerous, like plants of the field. You grew up and became tall, reached the age of fine ornaments. Your breasts were formed, your hair had grown, you were, yet you were naked and bare. And then I passed by you and I saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness, and I swore to you and entered a covenant with you so that you became mine. Now, if we would keep on reading, we see that God is now likening uh, Israel to a bride. And if those mixed metaphors make you uncomfortable, you know, not normally you're going to adopt a child and then marry them. That would be pretty awkward, right? doesn't really make a lot of sense. But the Bible is full of mixed metaphors, and they hit on different angles. And again, both are family aspects, and we're, both, we're going to touch on both of them, Lord willing, this weekend. But we, what we want to see here is that Israel is adopted by God because he just takes pity on them, and he says to them, live. Now, spoiler alert, it's not going to go very well. Let my son go that they might serve me. Will Israel do that? No. By the end of Deuteronomy, Moses even tells them, God speaking to him, this is Deuteronomy 32, 5 and 6, they've acted corruptly towards him. They are not his children because of their defect. They are perverse and crooked generation. Do you repay the Lord thus, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? He has made you and established you. And so Moses is telling the people, look, look what God did for you. He adopted you. He redeemed you. And yet you show no thanks. You do not act like children. You do not serve him. You do not fear him. And you forgot the God who gave you birth, is what he's going to say after this. And so 
They disowned him and spurned him. And what we come to then see is the exodus out of Egypt was awesome. Like it's amazing, but it's not enough. We need a better redemption. We need a second exodus. We need something that'll do better, that will actually change people's hearts to serve the Lord God who adopted them and attached his father to, uh, to them. And this is where the Bible is going. And the next place I want to land is with a man named David in the Davidic covenant. Second Samuel chapter seven, this is what God says again, a very unique statement of God's fatherhood attached to David. And this is what he says in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And I'm going to begin in what verse here? I'll go verse 12. This is what he tells David. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Here we go. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rods of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall never depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. The throne shall be established forever. From one angle, this is speaking about Solomon, who's going to build the temple for God. From another angle, it's going to be all the Judean kings that are going to come from David's line. But the only person who's going to get an eternal kingdom and have a unique title of sonship given to him is the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, par excellence, the ultimate son of David. And again, God is attaching his fatherhood and sonship to an individual who will come in the future long after David is dead. And so it's moving along. And then we get more information in the book of Daniel of this character and the nature of his kingdom. And I want to show you what this person is going to inherit. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus quotes it in the New Testament several times. Now look at what the son of David, in this case called the son of man, is going to inherit. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, at the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Look what he was given. Here's his inheritance. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Now, just like 2 Samuel chapter 7 said, look at his dominion. It's an everlasting dominion. This isn't a 70 year reign. This is an eternal kingdom which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, I want you to check something out here in verse 18 if you jump down. But the saints of the highest one, that is the believers in the Lord, look what it says here, will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom for all ages to come. Hmm. Okay, so I'm confused here. Is it the Son of Man who sits at God's right hand that receives a kingdom? Or is it the saints of the highest one that receive the kingdom? Who gets the inheritance? Is it the Son of Man or is it the Holy Ones? And the answer is yes, both do. Because the adoption to the Son of David is going to be spread out and what we would call, the big fancy word called, it gets democratized so that it's too big to be just for one individual, even if that one individual is the son of the living God, he wants to share it with the saints. And this is the amazing thing. It's already hinted at in the, in the Bible. It's a little confusing and, and quite mysterious, but it starts to pick up steam as we go along. And so we want to go back to this concept of fatherhood being tied to God's creative work, his rule, and his redemption. Because Israel failed, and they failed miserably. We need something better. We need a better exodus. And the prophet Isaiah speaks about this 
at length, and he uses actually that very language of a new exodus to come. But before that, again, one of the very few times where God speaks about himself as a father, Isaiah 63. Again, the more information we can gather in the Old Testament about what it means for God to be a father, the better. This is Isaiah 63, 16. For you are our father, Though Abraham does not know us, and indeed Israel does not recognize us, you, O Lord, are our Father. You're our Redeemer from of old, that is your name. Why, O Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? See, these individuals recognize that if you're called by God to be his son or his sons and daughters, it should come with a heart that actually fears him. But that's not going on. Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your inheritance. Your people, your holy people, possessed your sanctuary, sanctuary for a little while, but our adversaries have trodden it down. It's all a mess. We have become like those over whom you've never ruled, like those who were never called by your name. Notice that God's fatherhood is, is attached to his rule, and people who are called by his name to serve him and fear him. But these people say, but our hearts are like canes. They're hard. And so we need a father who is a potter. Check this. Keep going. 64 verse 6. This is the plight of all of us from the minute we're born. All of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. It's actually quite crass what this really is getting at. I'll leave it at that. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Look at this. All of us have gone aside. All of us have followed the, the seed of the serpent, the way of Cain. And we're in trouble. There's no one who calls on your name, who arouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. Hardened hearts, following after their own sin, nobody takes hold of God. What is God to do? Check this out. But now, O oh Lord, 64 verse 8, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. We need a Father who is a potter, who can take jars of clay, or he can take clay and either harden it, which he is, or he can then mold it and change the heart of stone that doesn't respond to him, that doesn't serve him, that doesn't fear him, that isn't ruled by him, that isn't called by him, and is changed so that it actually wants to and loves him and appreciates his salvation and can actually call upon him as a father, truly in faith. And so, what we find in Isaiah chapter 43 is the second exodus where God's adoption for the son of David is going to come for all peoples, and it's called the second Exodus. Chap chapter 43, verse 1. Now, thus says the Lord, your creator Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear. I've redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through fire, you will not be scorched nor will the flame burn you. Have you ever sing How Firm a Foundation? Do you know, know that song? Uh, one of my favorite, when through the deep waters I call thee to go, and the rivers of grief shall not be overflow, the flame shall not hurt, hurt thee, I only design uh, the dross to consume and the uh, gold to refine. That comes from this verse. And God is saying, look, I redeemed the people from Egypt long ago out of the waters, but I got a better salvation planned in the future. And then check what he says in 43, verse 6. This is quoted in the New Testament, by the way. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, and here we go, ladies, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, potter, changing hard hearts, even whom I have made. And God's divine choosing, as the potter, having a mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. He says, 
I'm taking my kids. And I'm going to take it from there. And I'm going to take it from there. And they're coming from the north. And they will come to me. And they will call me father. And it's not going to be like Israel the first time that didn't serve me. But they're going to have hearts that are changed. And they're going to weep for me. And how is this going to happen? Well, the son of David, who was promised the inheritance, the son of David, who would live 33 years of perfect law keeping, never sinning once, with thought and interaction, the Lord Jesus Christ, who set his face like a flint to Jerusalem, he says, I come for one purpose, I do my Father's will, I have the food that he gives me, I eat it, and I'm going to die. And I'm going to die for a people who have hard hearts that will never call upon me, that are like Cain and like Lamech, and I'm going to transform them, and I am going to die for their sins and the curse that they deserve. I'm going to take it on myself. And God treats Jesus at Calvary's cross as if you lived your life, so that God could look at you by faith in His Son and say, "I'm treating you like you lived Jesus' life, full pardon, full forgiveness." Don't even mention sin in my face. Those are my children, and I'm their father. And he changes their hearts, not so that they're perfect overnight, but so that they make progress over a lifetime, and it's genuine, and it's true. And it can truly be said in the new covenant, which is so glorious and where this is all going. God says, I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. Jeremiah 32, verse 40. John Piper writes that, he highlights that in people's Bibles when they come to ask about, how do I know that? I can be saved, or how can I know I have assurance of salvation? That's how you know, because God has said so. Because this redemption is far greater. This adoption far, far exceeds the one that Israel got. And that's exactly what the book of Ephesians says. If we go back to chapter 1, where all these themes come together in just beautiful fashion, if I can get there. Ephesians 1, 5. <clears throat> he predestined us to what? Adoption as sons. Through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption. Exodus redemption? No. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. This great adoption that now brings us into the inheritance that Jesus deserves of this eternal kingdom where he says, I'm going to share everything that belongs to me and I'm giving it to all my sons and daughters, all my brothers and sisters who call upon God as Father from a true heart. And so where Israel failed, this covenant creative work will not. And the Spirit now cries within our hearts, the gift of the Holy Spirit, to cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit of Adoption. I'm in the family, and I don't know how often you think about this. It almost sounds like it's blasphemy, but it's a biblical statement. God can no less, can love you no less than he loves the Lord Jesus. That almost sounds like no way. That's what God says. Listen to what he says in 1 John chapter 4, 17. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Why can we have confidence in the day of judgment? Because as he, that is Jesus, is, so also are we. Someday in the future when we don't struggle with sin anymore? No. In this world. Let me say that one more time. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. God loves you with the same love that he has for his only begotten son who never sinned ever because he atoned for you. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God and we are. And so this redemption will not fail and we can call on God as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father. Poor 
four takeaways from fatherhood and adoption. Number one, I like alliteration. So there are four C's. Communion. Just, that's sort of just a, another fancy word for having a relationship with God. So Jesus teaches us when you pray, don't be like the Pharisees and people who like them to see. And he says, go to your closet, Matthew 6, verse 6. Go, be secret with God the Father, and your Father who sees you will, let me know, he will reward you. Be intimate with God. He will reward you. He's a rewarder of those who seek him. He's your dad. Why would you not want to spend time with him? He wants to spend time with you. Communion. Secondly, consecration, which again is a big word, which means basically just to be set apart for holiness. To free from to flee from the defilement of the world. The doctrine of adoption is directly tied to flee from sin in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is what it says. God says, therefore, come out from their midst, that is the world, and be separate. Do not touch what is unclean. Don't go there. You see those temptations? To go to the place you shouldn't go, to do the thing you shouldn't do, to watch the thing you shouldn't watch. Do not touch what is unclean. Why? And I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, 2 Samuel 7, 16. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, Isaiah 43, says the Lord Almighty. The doctrine of adoption is given to us to fight sin. And the Apostle Paul says, look, we have these promises, beloved. Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit as we perfect holiness in the fear of God. The promises of adoption and where it's going help us to say all this fool's gold, all this stuff that the world tempts me with and allures me with, that I know actually won't satisfy my soul. I can fight that with these promises of what adopted children can go on God as Father get. Consecration. Number three, crying. Crying. Romans 8 verse 16 says, the spirit of adoption that's given to us in our hearts has us cry out, Abba, Father. And I just want to read from a book, probably the best book that you can, you can buy on the Holy Spirit by a man named St. Bert Ferguson. And he just talks about this beautiful verse. Well, what does it mean to cry out, Abba, Father? Maybe you've heard that a bunch of times and people say, well, it's like, what's well, just like calling God Daddy? Well, it's certainly more than that. But it's in the cry itself. I hope this isn't too confusing. If it is, I'll try to make it clear. At the very least, this crying Abba Father illustrates the spirit bearing witness with our spirits that we are God's children and therefore joint heirs together with Christ. That means the inheritance is yours. The logic is clear. Through the Spirit, we enter into the sense of God's sonship, which Jesus experienced in the context of humanity. And we have the experiential evidence of our adoption. And experiential evidence just means that you actually experience being God's child. How? Even more striking than the logical implications is the experiential phenomenon. It is in the cry that God's children of the Spirit bears witness. So the fact that the Christian's own spirit, that is your own spirit that cries out, does display an awareness of sonship as the rest of the New Testament makes clear, amazing though it is, the problem is that this awareness is often weakened. And maybe you can relate to this. And God's children may even find themselves doubting their gracious status and privileges as God's children. But what Paul is saying, however, is that even in the darkest hour, there is a cooperative and affirmative testimony given by the Spirit. It is found in the very fact that although the child of God may be broken and bruised, tossed about with fears and doubts, the child of God nevertheless, in their need, cries out, Father! as instinctively as a child who has fallen and been hurt, calls out in a similar language, Dad, help me! Assurance of sonship is not reserved for highly sanctified Christians. It is the birthright of even the weakest 
and most oppressed believer. This is its glory. And so when you cry out in your deepest need and your darkest hour, and you say, help me, Father, that's crying out, Abba, Father. That's the spirit of sonship. Lastly, and this is where we started, Ephesians 5 verse 2, conformity. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. The only way you can actually do it is if you believe that God loves you, as much as he says he loves you, as his child, then you can start walking in love. And my prayer is that this weekend, uh, it would work to that end. So, once again, the four C's. Communion, you'll be with the Father. Consecration, get away from the world and the stuff that your Father would say, no, come away from there. Cry out to him and be conformed to his image. Father God, we thank you so much that we can call you that very name. Oh God, that you would actually press it upon our hearts through the spirit of adoption, that we would know all the more just how beloved we are, and that you transform us to love with the right mind.